that's called in the glory land. Welcome to Nashville, Tennessee. This is Larry and Gloria. We have special guests today, Marnie from South Dakota, and we're going to have a fun morning. And a good time. We've looked forward to this for a long time, and we're just so excited to have Sherry McPherson with us from Wisconsin. And wow, you know, we've known you for a long time, and we're going to just kind of get to know each other again all over. How's everything going, Sherry? Really good, really busy. We're doing well, good. you're always busy. I know. Bring us up to where, where we met. How did we meet? When was that first time? I kind of remember. Do you remember? I didn't remember until we talked the other day, and then Gloria reminded me, but I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my story and, you know, hopefully help people that are going through the same things that I have experienced. But wow. it was Toma Assembly of God Church in Wisconsin, where you guys came to give ministry and to sing and Matt had my husband had met you many years ago you remember that Gloria yes he, I he told me <laughs> that night at Tomo after the program he comes to the table and we start to chitter chat it was like we'd known each other our whole life and he said he said he's I think I was seven or eight years old and it was at Bethel Assembly of God Church in Minneapolis I don't know if it was just Minneapolis but or what yeah. the actual address was but and he said, I remember it was our first, Larry's and my first wedding anniversary. Wow. And uh, so that was a long time ago. And then we came to Toma. And so we were chitter chatting at the table. And he was reminding me of that yes. way back as a kid. And, you know, uh, being with Matt there, we were at your place some time back. And we were at the place. And I, I was amazed at how uh, magnanimous he is in inventing and doing all the different things. And as I'm looking right over your shoulder <laughs> at those beautiful guitars. Uh -huh. McPherson guitars. <laughs> yes. McPherson guitar. Some of them. I, I probably go bananas every time I see one on television <laughs> because it's, there it is. <laughs> when we first moved here, Sherry, from uh, South Dakota about five years ago and coming down the escalator to the BNA airport, there was a McPherson yes. guitar in that beautiful case. I said, yes, yes. yes. And we've seen those all over. I mean, mm. they are used. Oh, my. You, know, you have Amy Grant and mm. uh, you have uh, Caveman. You have how many? You have the Newsboys have, the Mercy Me, uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman. Uh, there's so many gospel groups that have it, a lot yeah. of country groups. So every time we see one on a program or a concert, Larry says, there yeah. it is. You see, the sound hole in that guitar is in a different location than most of the guitars yeah. are. Signature and at that when that steps out at you like that, you, <laughs> hey, that's got to be a McPherson guitar. Yeah. So it's that's where we met the, the for that you know the next time, and then we went out to your home and you fixed us. There was a day after we were in Toma for that rally, <laughs> and you fixed us the most delicious uh, coffee cake. I don't know, it was, I don't know, it was blueberry, or whatever it was. I still oh, remember okay. it was so good, and that's kind of where we kind of started to reconnect. And I was praying about a prayer partner. And you've become a dear, dear prayer partner and a dear friend all these years. And you have for me as well, Gloria, both of you, you know, anytime we would shoot a prayer request, I know that you guys prayed and likewise for us. So, yeah, well, we need each other. We do. You we know, do. I just want to kind of start out with this is interesting. You know, when people see uh, where you have been so active in so many ministries, you grew up in families from what I understand that your families actually, when you were kids, you traveled and sang. And yes. then when you, and then you and, and uh, Matt were in a, a group together kind of when you were young. How yeah, that we, auditioned, we auditioned for a, a Christian band that was going to be for Faith Broadcasting Network, a Christian television network in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and they were going to need um, studio musicians to play for the show. And I'd never been in a band before, and Matt had, you know, he's had traveled more than me. I was 19 at the time. And uh, my mom had received this invitation in the mail or an announcement for, for you know, musicians auditioning and she kept saying sherry i think you should audition for this 
well, that scared the heck out of me. I'm like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> no, I was in college, you know, and I was home for the weekend. She just could not get that out of her mind. And I finally said, okay, mom, I'll go audition, you know, not thinking anything. And, you know, I was trained classically for piano, you know, since I was five. And so I knew how to read music. I was, I could play by ear and I was a songwriter and I could play some guitar, you know, but I'm just fresh out of high school, you know? So we went and um, my dad came with me and I was so nervous on that. I had to sight read music and I had to sing and I thought, oh, there's no way they want me. Well, they, you know, took me on and they took Matt on and that's how we met. And we traveled wow. with that group for a while. And the, the television network ended up going under, it never actually came to be so but we got engaged and married out of it. So <laughs> well, look, and, and the rest is, is not history yet, but it's making history. So tell us a little bit about so you were married when? What year? 1980. 1980. Wow. June 7th, 1980. Oh, tell us about your family here in this photo. You know, the one down in the left corner is the one picture we took when we first met you out at your home. Oh, no kidding. Yes, oh. that was taken the morning of the fabulous coffee cake. <laughs> oh, the coffee cake. Okay. Um, the picture of our family, that is actually only part of our family. And that was, let's see, two years ago. So to the left of me is our adopted daughter, Diana. We, she is from Romania. She's oh. Romanian. We adopted her at age 18. Whole nother story, her and her brother, David, he's not in the picture. Uh, to the right of Matt is our daughter-in-law, Anna Chapman McPherson, and my, our youngest son, Brennan, and their daughter, Willow. And the two little boys belong to Diana and her husband, Brandon, Luca and Ezra. And now we have a little girl named Sarah. Oh, how uh -huh. sweet. And Your family Anna is growing. Anna's expecting them with a little boy at the end of June. So. Oh, look, well, the boys, there's going to be a lot of McPherson boys there. Yep, and we have two other grand grandkids. Um, Olivia is 17 and Lance is 24. Oh, my. He it just seems like doctor. yesterday. <laughs> yeah, that's that, part of us there. So. Oh, I know. You, 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 sometimes when they're little, you say, I wonder if they'll ever grow up. And then it's like, when I look at that picture and I remember they were just little kids when we saw, you know, most of them weren't even there. And then all of a sudden now they're up and they're married and they have their children and a whole new mission field. But you know, yeah. Sherry, when we think about uh, people, which God has blessed you and Matt and yeah. your family and your ministry so much with so much going on. But a lot of times people look at us and say, well, must be nice. You don't have any problems, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, they think, you know, because you're on stage or because you have you've uh, uh, created a guitar, you know, the bow, the hunting, the bow. The bow. Yes. yes, that's a whole nother thing. That's a whole nother story within itself right there. Yeah. Matthew's uh, incorporated. Mm -hmm. And he told me how what, one time how that uh, God showed him how to make the single cam bow i don't think it was ever invented until he did it that's correct and wow but didn't god give him a dream in a dream sometimes we want to have him on he had a dream in the middle of the night he woke up sat straight up and he said i just got a new concept for a bow it was like two in the morning and i'm like honey are you sleep talking what's <laughs> on? and he had to get up and and write it down and I, I think maybe he came to bed two, three hours later. Um, and then it took another, I, I, I can't say for sure that I'm correct on this, but at least a year, year and a half for it to wow. have come to completion. So then he started out, I thought he said like in a little garage or something or just a small building. And now it you're was, in Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was the Sanford and Son building. If those yeah. of you remember <laughs> that show. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> With so how many are employed there now in, with the, the bow and with the guitars? How many are how many are employed there now? We have about 400 employees. Ooh, that's um, a lot of mouths to feed. It is. It's a lot of families. And um, during the COVID shutdown, we were shut down for like eight weeks. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was, it was rough. It was stressful, especially for Matt and the, his guys and the employees as well. And he took care of them the whole eight weeks. And when they came back, I mean, the loyalty just went sky high and, and we were just, God multiplied more than what we had lost. And so oh, isn't that wonderful story? Yeah. Great testimony. Great testimony. Well, you know, um, among all of that, of the victories, and of course, you know, uh, and we'll talk about today and uh, in a little bit also, but you had the salvation poem. Can you yes. just give us a little bit about that? Well, when Matt started, it started with a prayer. Matt said, Lord, I want to write a song that will affect the world. And he just said, please give me a song that people can accept you as they sing it. And so it wasn't long after he asked that, that he was in the basement with his guitar and and he just the holy spirit inspired him and he started writing he got all the lines except for the second to the last line he's like oh i just can't get that in that last line second to the last line i just can't get it i think i'll go ask sherry maybe she'll come up with it so he comes running upstairs i got this song i got this song let me sing it for you i'm missing a line he sang through it once and i said change my life and make it new he's oh. like that's it that's it oh that's great you know so I was so I didn't realize how big the song would become and how many people would get saved through this poem as a song because we do also have it in literature for missionaries we have it on cards as you placed in front there yes and I you know years later as it started to really show and and just make wave on the internet and across the world i'm like thank you god that you let me be in on the song i made one line (laughs) he made it it's like he just downloaded it into me so how many languages is that in now it is in approximately 90 languages and it has reached over 270 million people wow what with the help we we um partnered with cbn a few years ago with their super book series. They did a new mm-hmm. super book series and they put our song at the end of every episode. And so our team here with Salvation Poem, we they were working on translations with the connections we had. And then CBN was working on translations with the connections they had. And so it has grown to uh, almost 90 and there's some languages being worked on right now. So you, if you go to the salvationpoem.com, and you click on languages, you will see alphabetically all the languages that it's in. Amazing. I mean, I God just, is amazing. I just wanted to add uh, from, from South Dakota here, uh, we have a, a local radio station that we have on 24-7. And they play the Salvation Poem uh, oh. periodically. And so every time I hear it, I'm like, I know who wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so even up here in South Dakota and Minnesota, um, it continues to go out. And I've also heard it as I've uh, taught our little kids on Wednesday nights. Um, we sometimes watch the Superbook series. And so I've okay. seen it on there. And I just thought, that's amazing. So just wanted to add a little testimony. That's that's and wonderful. Like, hey, that's wonderful. it's here too. So thank you so much. Here. I'm so glad. <laughs> Larry and I were in the living room and and I had taken an old trunk out of our garage. We're still going through stuff for moving. Heavens, we'll if we ever get through it. And That's anyway, but one of the cases I had was filled with old diaries of mine. So I thought, oh man, I think I'm just going to throw the whole thing. We just don't need any more, you know, we just don't need any more stuff around here. So I'll just throw sure. it and look at them. But I just grabbed out a section of about eight or 10 of my diaries. I took them out. And when I looked at it, here in there was a, was a diary from... It was from 1999, and in the diary, folded up in in a page there, was a letter that we, an email letter that you and I had exchanged from 1999. And I and I was thinking about this earlier when we were 
talk about doing this program is that many people look and say, well, boy, it must be nice. You don't have any problems you've achieved in this and this and this and all over the world. All of us have a ministry. But, you know, there's, I call it backstage. I was always going to write a book and get it done in, in a title of backstage, but I haven't got it done. But anyway, you know, there's yeah. stories behind our stories and behind our testimonies. And I, I, if you don't mind, it's okay if I read this email, Sherry? It's okay sure. if I read this? Okay. Because I think sometimes we need to look through the door and peek into the back room to see really where mm -hmm. what has happened and what God has done to bring us through. Because a lot of people just say, must be nice. You don't have any problems. So I'm going to read this. What uh, This was from December 4th, 1999. Okay. He said, Dear Larry and Gloria, I'm sorry it's taken me so long to respond to your letter, and thank you for the phone call. To be honest with you, we're not doing very well. This has dealt us a terrible blow. You see, I've, been, I've lost five babies now, the recent ones being just a year ago, and then this one. This one being the most difficult. I was further along, and we saw several ultrasounds of this baby alive and kicking. We were so hopeful, especially since it took seven years to get pregnant. Well, I just found out the day before Thanksgiving that there was no heartbeat. I wasn't expecting to hear those words, nor was I prepared for the devastation I would face afterwards. I delivered our little boy, who was named Kevin Michael. He was six inches long and fully formed. He had been gone for at least 10 days, so his appearance wasn't as good as we'd hoped, but still, we held him, we cried, we said our last goodbye. Then I, I was sent home to deal with a whole set of other emotions, questions and frustrations. You know, we realize that Satan would love to destroy us through this and keep us incapable of ministry. Well, I feel pretty destroyed. I'm hoping that in time it will get easier and I will actually feel like singing again. And I think about from 1999 and all the things you've gone through, we're going to talk about several of them, but how God is bringing back, has brought back songs. He's brought back ministry. So anyway, when I read that, I thought, where were you at that stage of life? What was happening? Well, I was 40 years old and um, wasn't expecting to get pregnant. Um, you know, we, our oldest son had grown. And, well, I'm trying to think, maybe he was more like 17. Um, yeah, it was... I was leading worship in the local church and just taking care of our kids. And, and um, so it was, it was hard. I mean, Matt hadn't able, he hadn't come with me to the altar zone. He says, honey, should I come with you? And I said, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. You know, so he feels so terrible, felt terrible that he wasn't with me and I'm driving home crying so hard. I can hardly, you know, see the road. And, um, it was about, uh, took about six months before I really felt like myself. And at that point, that was when fibromyalgia struck my body and hasn't left. So um, I think oftentimes, even though I'd lost others in the past, um, this, like I said, this was more difficult. It was, but I realized from in the past, there were times where I didn't grieve. I stuffed it. I buried it. I'm like, I've got two other little kids to take care of here. Um, you know, I, I got to mm -hmm. stay strong for them. I got to stay focused. And, and that grief never went away. You can bury grief, but it doesn't leave. Mm -hmm. You have to face it. You have to go through it and you need help going through it. And so when, after losing Kevin Michael, I did, I did take time. And so did Matt. We took time that we felt we needed, you know, to grieve as best we could. So we picked up, you know, life after that. How did it affect your marriage? You know, uh, I mean, they say losing a child is the worst because you you lose, your, you know, the future of that child. Your dreams, you have dreams, you know what you, you, what you want for your family. How did it affect your marriage when going through that grieving process? Were you able to encourage each other? Or were you, some days you were both down, some days both we being able patient. to handle it? We were patient with each other. Um, you know, we both knew how we were hurting, how the other one was hurting. And 
I, it just, we just flowed with it. Um, our oldest son, Matt Jr. really, really struggled. And uh, I look back now and think, you know, maybe we should have gotten him into some counseling or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so we, we just stayed close, it, you know. And that's, you know, that's so important because so many marriages break up if it, with the death of a child or, you know, miscarriage. And I had three of them. So I, I know what that feeling was, mm -hmm. you know, that, that gives you bond from the moment of conception and you're, you're yes. there, you're together. And all of a sudden you're ripped up. And so the mother has one feeling and because you yeah. connected, you felt that. Yeah. And so, you know, it is, it's quite to, so, you know, with your, you have those dreams for your children and for the babies. And then you think, okay, I'm, we're coming through this. Well, we're going to make it. And then it, it's like somebody said to me, it's kind of like looking down the track and saying, uh, oh boy, the train just went through town, but I see another one coming. <laughs> and life sometimes deals out. There's more trains that come along that's going to try to wipe us out. Um, you know, you've had several things that have happened in your lives. Yeah. What would you want to share? You know, share about, can you just take a few minutes and share about your son, Justin? Okay. So Justin was born May 24th, 1985. And he was our second son and uh, Matt Jr., Justin, and then Brennan. And from the beginning, um, I noticed that he had trouble learning. He had trouble with nursing, latching on. And I had already had my first son and it was like, well, yeah, the baby knows what to do. This baby didn't know what to do for about three days. And so that was a struggle. And as he, he grew, he was late sitting up. He was late crawling. His, his speech was fine. It seemed fine. He would say words kind of cute, you know, in his own way, but, um, he was late in walking, late in learning how to ride a bike. We homeschooled. So with kindergarten, I could see, wow, and I think I got to do this over again. And um, so we we didn't know exactly what, what was wrong and what we were dealing with. And um, we went to a homeopathic medical doctor in Madison for a while for our kids. And um, Justin was really reacting to sugar and to color dyes. And so, you know, you just kind of go through all of that, ad adjusting the diet and he felt deprived, of course, because he couldn't have sugar for a year and a half. But oh my! So at age thirteen, we had him tested by professionals for learning disabilities, and he did have significant ones. Um, and so it, it was interesting because back then we were pioneers in homeschooling. I, I only knew one other family when I started Matthew with homeschooling, and that really? was in Minnesota. And in, in Wisconsin, parents were being arrested. So, you know, that whole thing has come a long, long way. And so the head psychologist said, the best thing you can do for this boy is to teach him at home. So we continued to, and um, at age 16, we, it, it, he was getting really difficult. It just, with his emotions, and um, he he just socially was not normal. And so Matt and him flew to, um, well, I was with too, we flew to the Amen Clinic in California, in Orange County. And Matt and Justin had brain scans done, awake and asleep. And it showed, they did this whole three days of, you know, psych psychological anal analysis and all this. And it came out that he was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. I had never heard of it. I heard of autism. And when I read the explanation, I'm like, that fits him to a T. And in all this time, we've wondered what is, what's wrong? What's not right? What, you know, how do we help him? And there was really no help for Asperger's. There was all kinds of help for autism. Uh, and so we got him working at our company and, you know, just part time. We had all our boys, you know, learning how to work. And so that was good. He was limited in what he could do. Um, then his behaviors became very extreme. Um, and he at the we didn't know at the time, but he got into some very dark 
things, dark thoughts. And we were just in warfare all the time, all the time, just praying and God, how do we fight this whole thing? And um, in his twenties, you know, he wanted to have a girlfriend and he wanted to, he had no clue how to date a girl he didn't want to get married he thought marriage was scary and you know <laughs> and so because of his imbalances and everything well it wasn't until he was 31 years old um he was diagnosed with bipolar but what came and prior to that we kept bringing him to the doctor they kept putting him on antidepressants are you depressed yes well he's depressed but antidepressants do not work for bipolar it's the wrong, wrong thing to give someone with bipolar. So if the antidepressant isn't working, they need to check further and see what else is going on. Well, um, he was so, you know, at times we could see he had this beautiful heart. He was so loving and so yes. kind and he would hurt for other people. And I just, we would get glimpses of that, but the bipolar would just kind of bury it. And, um, so he, it just went so long without him being on a medication to be stable. And he ended up having a psychotic break, which was very frightening. Um, we, he was a police officer had called Matt one day. Well, we never get a call from police officers. You know, do you have a son named Justin McPherson? We're like, yeah. So what Justin had been doing was overdosing on energy drinks and not sleeping. And mm. that can throw anybody into a psychotic whatever, you know, but he was already imbalanced. And so there it came. He was hallucinating. He was, was psychotic. And they brought him by ambulance to, they first of all did like a blood sugar test, you know, to see is this diabetes, is it, you know, undiagnosed and, so he went to the Sparta hospital and then they looked for an opening in the psych unit in La Crosse, which there was only one place. They used to have two or three and they just kept having less and less. And so there was one opening, thank the Lord. And he went and that's where he was diagnosed. And we did have a, a meeting, Brennan, Matt and I with the psych, the psychiatrist, um, wonderful doctor. And he said, it's very difficult to diagnose bipolar unless they have a psychotic break. And I thought to myself, this just can't be. I mean, imagine all the families and all the people suffering with it and the, the family members trying to figure this out. And now when someone has a psychotic break, they're, they're delusional, they're, and some of the delusions were just so hard to even hear him speak out of his mouth, but the doctor said the medications don't always take that away. So I know we contacted you guys. We contacted everybody we knew that would pray. And after about a couple of weeks, he, the delusions stopped, the psychosis stopped and Justin was calm for the first time in his life. Wow. And then after 29 days, he was able to come back home. So, you know, we've, we cared for him his whole life. Um, and so that was another big part of our lives. We didn't go on very many vacations because he would be calling us every hour on the hour and he'd be panicking and he'd be, you know, he could drive a car, but then it was always this, I was almost in an accident, you know, like every day. <laughs> and oh, nerve -wracking. very, very, very nerve wracking, very stressful. And um, yeah, so, you know, a lot of our lives revolved around caring for him and not really being able to go and, you know, do a lot of things that would help Matt and I get away, you know? Yes. Yes. You would have Marty, somebody... do you have the uh, photos there of Justin? I think you have a couple photos there. Just, you're just a wonderful, wonderful kid. Just, yeah. Uh, the one on the left, my left, um, where he's younger, he's in his twenties there. And he, really liked to style his hair and he was very handsome, very, very yes. tall and thin, mm -hmm. you know, he just, you know, was amazing. And um, then when he got on the bipolar meds, um, he, he realized how messed up he really is. 
And one day he told Matt and, and Matt and him just had this bond. I mean, Matt just, he would fall apart during the day if Justin was falling apart. I mean, it was just like that. And I was home all the time and I was getting counseling on, you know, how do I deal with this? And um, so he said to Matt, he goes, you know, dad, no girl's ever going to love me. I'm too oh. screwed up. I'm too oh. messed up. And then when Matt told me, our hearts just broke. It's like, you know, we, we talked earlier about having dreams for your child, having dreams for our son. I wanted him to fall in love. I wanted him to get married and have children and have a ministry or have a career or something, you know? And, and so all of those desires and all the prayers that I prayed into that didn't happen. And so it was kind of like his whole life we were grieving in at one stage or another. And so um, after he was home, he and he was calm, we saw his full, beautiful heart. And we just fell more and more in love with him and he just can I give you a hug mom you know yes and um he, it was hard for him he had to go get a, one of the vax one of the excuse me one of the um medications was a shot in the arm once a month and that was slow release which is very helpful for people with bipolar because a lot oftentimes they go off their meds I don't want to be honest anymore because there's side effects you know another medication he took was to counteract the side effects and so Matt said, you know, Justin, if you go off your medications, you won't be able to drive your car. And not once did he go off his medication because he drove his car every day. <laughs> <laughs> and he was not able to work at that point. Um, so anyway, I don't know if you have anything you want to ask and before we get to the rest of the well, story. I think this is really interesting for people with their dealing with bipolar because the depression today, and it's on the news every oh day, the, the depression oh. and the bipolar and uh, everything that is gripping our young people and our young people are just, they're looking for peace. They're looking for truth and they, yeah. they don't have a lot of role models and, uh, and they're, they're just, you know, they're crying out. And so in desperation, then the body takes over and then the mind, and of course, Satan gets in there and uh, yeah. Yeah. messes with it, you know. So right. this is all very important for you to share with parents. Um, yes. We know people who are struggling with that. And so any information like that that you give helps us. And so so you went through the bipolar and uh, he always had that twinkle, you know, the few times we were with him. He always had that little twinkle in his eye. And yet he had that look like, who are you? What do you want? What are you doing? <laughs> you know, just had that look like, why are you here? You know. <laughs> oh, what's going on but he was he was delightful and so that would be great if that was known you know uh, I read a deal the other day and said if only grief had a roadmap you know it's kind of like Sherry if we said we, we could just get on our phone and, and we could get on our phone and say Siri tell me how do I get out of grief and it will <laughs> come back here's the roadmap follow it but there's some things in life that we don't have a roadmap. Exactly. And the things we just have to get on the journey and start first acknowledging, you know, what the problem is and to go on. So yeah. from there, from that point, in fact, you know, Sherry, sure, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have you share a little bit more here. But then I want to bring you back for next week because I want you to share the rest of the story. But I want you to give an opening and an entrance to this next story and then by then we'll continue what we're going to share next week. Okay. So kind of go from here, from where he, in his last couple of years. Um, well, on my birthday, July 7th, 2020, um, it was discovered that Justin had a tumor um, that he didn't tell us about. And it was visible to me at that point and I asked him about it and he just terror hit his face and his eyes and like he didn't want me to know and so I called Matt I was shaking I knew it was bad 
And he came home, called the, the hospital, and they brought him to the hospital. And um, they it was testicular cancer stage four. And so, did he have any idea? You think he had an idea, or I mean, I know he knew there was something wrong. Justin knew, and and I said, "Why didn't you tell us?" He said, "I was too embarrassed." Mm -hmm. So, see, there's the Asperger part. You know, it's like he didn't have reasonable fear. He had fear of things that you normally wouldn't fear, and then the things that you should fear, he didn't have. Interesting. So, yeah, it, and and so that you know, ended up um, taking his life. And so for the next podcast, we can, we can talk about that. Yes. On yes. Well, you know, you, the journey has been long. Uh, you know, I mean, it's been, it's a year and a half. How long has it been since he passed away? Oh, uh, it was two years, February 11th. Two years already. And just seems like, wow. You've gone, you've had a long journey and uh, you have know, really tried to walk and pray with you through this time because mm -hmm. our hearts have been that. broken with you. But, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, to watch how God has been helping you. What do you think, you know, we're going to talk about the grieving because grieving is a whole other subject. I mean, I, we were really concerned for you and Matt because anytime you lose a child, some of you love that dearly. It can, it can totally destroy a marriage, a home, the family, your faith, even your faith. Did you come under attack on your faith because you believed, you mm -hmm. knew he was going to be healed? Did you ever come under attack for that? I did. And, um, you know, some of the family members around me were saying, he's going to die. He's going to die. And I was holding to God as my healer, as Justin's healer. I've experienced physical healing myself, and I know him as healer God. And so I was reading a, a book to him, Christ the Healer, you know, at the end when, when, you know, through the treatments, the treatments weren't working and we knew, you know, it was either going to be a miracle from God or he was going to take him home. And, and I chose to believe up until that moment. Um, and so I, you know, just having your son die is difficult enough, but to, feel like my faith wasn't enough. Why was my faith not enough? And oh, I, I was offended. I was angry. I, I questioned everything that I ever believed about the word of God. Yes. I didn't stay there, but I, I went there. I did. You camped out there. I did for a bit. I did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, God has his way of working things out, not many times not the way we planned by any means but when your faith comes under attack the devil he, he can come and he'll, he'll find the weakest point he comes to you because know, we know a lot of people who've lost a lot of loved ones yes. and children parents you know, whatever in accidents cancer whatever you know and this it's always this you know, the Satan will come and say well if you you know if god was really god and a god of love this would have happened or you know or if god if prayers are answered why didn't you answer your prayers? Was there sin in your life? I, I've had that approach to me through the years with bad health. I had somebody walk up to me, uh, come into a room and just said, they walked in. I was so sick. I couldn't even get out of bed. We were back in Minnesota at a big retreat deal for families. And I couldn't even get out of bed to go do my sessions. And so somebody asked if they could come to my room and pray for me. And I was all, yes, Lord, yes, yes. So they brought him in and they looked at me and then all of a sudden they said, what's the sin in your life? If you just confess your sin, you, this wouldn't happen. You would be up and you'd oh, be well, please. you know, and I remember oh. just going like, ah, it was like, get them out of here now, you know, exactly. so, exactly. so people will, you know, they just, you know, you don't think, but God is, sure. is bringing you through. He's taking these tests and these trials uh, but you've had, you, you, you mentioned a book that we we're going to talk about for the next program also, but you mentioned a book that, uh, that you found help with that you have recommended. What is this? My you just dear, got in the mail yesterday. Oh my goodness. My dear, dear friend, Cherie, um, she lost her brother a few years before we lost Justin and, and it was devastating for her. And 
someone had given her that book. And so that's what she gave me. And now we received a lot of books from people at, at the funeral, after the funeral. And I picked them up. That's doing nothing. That's doing nothing. <laughs> and then after about a month, I picked up Dark Clouds, Deep Mercy. And I started it and I stayed with it. That book brought me out of despair. It wow. taught me how to grieve. And, and if I could just, you know, a couple of things, just some highlights on this. Yes, book, yes. I think, um, we just got two phone calls yesterday, you know, of two people that, that we love dearly that passed away. And I mean, every week is two or three people and they're grieving, but they don't know how to grieve. And that's why I feel yeah. like God has you. Here and I didn't point. either. And, and um, I have given away at least 70 copies of these books. Right. As soon as I get down, I get about 10 at a time. And I just wait for the, the person who lost a loved one or, you know, you know, Sherry, do you have anything that can help with grief? And this book is it, this book. And I think every pastor should read it. I think every evangelist should read it. I think, you know, pretty much everyone. But when you're in it, it says, it's, it says to lament is Christian. And he has a whole chapter on that. It's it's he has a few psalms that we read and a few verses from Lamentations. Now, Sherry, that, let me let me interrupt right here. I opened the book last night and I literally opened it to that page. To lament is Christian. And I looked at that and I read it and I read it again. And I thought. Wow. Okay, go ahead. So I was not able to be in the word. Um, I, I was with this book because he had specific scriptures that that pertain to your grief, that pertain to what you're going through at the time. You know, it's like you can't read rejoicing scriptures and sing rejoicing songs when you are in grief. That's right. And And you shouldn't feel guilty about it because that's that's not, it, it, it just works against you, right? Mm -hmm. He says, cry out to God. Be honest with God. And when I saw that, I'm like, okay. Here we go. Yes, with you, God. Are you ready for this? <laughs> <laughs> but he says, come humble. Pray the Bible. Be honest. Don't just complain. So it's okay to complain, but don't stay there, you know? And so there's just so much in this book, so much. And I have many friends that are reading it right now because so many people are losing loved ones. There's so many people dying. Yes, right? yes. Sick and, and you know, yes. what do you do? And not everybody can afford a counselor. Some people do well with a, a grief group. But because I had this and we had wonderful support from family and friends, I just didn't feel like I needed to go to a grief group. I didn't feel comfortable with that. But I know people who have been helped tremendously from it. So, well, you know what, Sherry, this is going to be great because uh, I told her, I said, I, in fact, our son Donovan said, Mom, I just believe when you have Sherry on, you need to do yes. two programs. He said, <laughs> you need to follow up. And so what we're going to do is next week, we're going to have you on again. And I want you to address the, uh, the funeral, how you handled that, how you went through that, okay. how people responded to you, what they said, what they should have said, shouldn't have said, uh, how to <laughs> grieve, how not to grieve, yeah. and, uh, and the keys to coming back to God, giving you a song again in your heart. Because now you've written, you wrote a song, you wrote a song about heaven. Can you tell them just a bit about that? Um, well, three days after Justin passed away, I wrote a song to Justin. And, and then shortly after that, I wrote a song, Heaven Come Down. But while Matt and Justin were doing the treatments, they went all the way to Florida and they were gone for three months. And that's the longest we've ever been separated. That was, that was really tough. And I pressed into the Lord. He kept giving me songs for that time that, that I sang to myself that I needed. And so I had this collection, right? And the, the, the time period of his treatment was seven months. 
And then he came home, you know, for a few weeks before he passed. And, and that was with him all the time. So I, this is my compilation of songs for me during his treatment, a song to Justin and, you know, three songs after he passed. And oh. so then I couldn't sing. Mm -hmm. I didn't know when I was going to get the album done, but we titled it Heaven, Our Final Home. And wow. so oh, there's a lot of encouraging songs on there. It's not all, oh, poor me. And it's not all about heaven. Um, but it, it directs our thoughts and our minds to heaven. So Yes. And I, I also next week, I want you to share the message that you've received. The mm -hmm. letter. Uh, yeah, you'd have to be sure and invite somebody to tune in next week. Yes, Please do right. call several friends. Okay. Tell them to watch this one and then tell them to tune in next week. And uh, because it's going to be a life changer. It's going to be an encouragement to you. And you, you can spend $150 for a, to go to a counselor for an hour. But you know what? It costs you nothing to tune this in. And I just know that God's going to continue to anoint Sherry. Yes. And she's going to have the things that God has shared with her, the Holy Spirit has shared, that will help you. So we just want to encourage you to please tell people to tune in. And Marty, I'm going to invite you back on the screen that you can tell them where to tune this in and to share it with others, okay? Yes, absolutely. So thank you so much, Sherry, already for your honesty and your vulnerability. I keep thinking of... Uh, you know, sometimes after those encounters with the Lord, you kind of walk with a limp and you can recognize that someone has been with the Lord through the hard times. And uh, we can recognize by the grace and uh, just the beautiful humility that you have, that you have walked with the Lord through hard things. And so thank you for thank you. sharing that with us now and looking forward to really hearing the rest of the story next week. So today you can upload, uh, by the end of today, I will have this uploaded to www.larrylundstromministries.org. Just click on the big CC Live banner on the front page. It will take you to all of the CC Live videos. This one will be the first one as it is the most current. And in order to share, just click in the top right-hand corner. There's three little white dots that will open up the link so you can share it however it works for you. Thank you for joining us, Sherry. Thank you. Thank Look you for forward to the next one. And, and in Thank the future you. sometime, we want to have your husband, Matt, on and share yes. his yeah. testimonies. Yeah, that'll be exciting. So we okay. want to thank all of you for joining us today. Be sure to contact people. We're praying for you. We're in a prayer room seven to eight every morning. And we're praying for your requests. And uh, have a great week. God bless you. Bye-bye. About 50 years ago in South Dakota The Lundstroms knelt in prayer to God one night There the Savior sent us with the message That we should sing about eternal life We've been rolling down that long, lonesome highway Traveling to help our fellow man And we'll keep traveling on Sing an happy song until we hear God's call to glory land. We've met a lot of friends in all our travels. We're so blessed. We know their prayers have helped us stay alive. And we're so thankful. So if you ever feel impressed to mention my name, then you